and sort of wrapping up class. So let me jump over to our IOB classroom here real quick. So here we are at the very end of week seven. We have a pretty fun, chill class today. We're gonna talk about camouflage and mimicry and ways that animals either try to purposely blend in or purposely stand out from their environment in different ways. And then coming up next week, so here we are at week seven, but if we scroll all the way down to week eight, we have our final exam. And I actually have to go in and fix it so that it comes up on the right days. So actually I'll go ahead and do that right now. So our final exam is going to be due on the end of the day on Wednesday, five twenty-six. The twenty-sixth day of May is the last day to get your final exam turned in. The final works very similarly to the midterm, where there is a Google Doc version that's very much like a test that you would take if you're sitting down at a table and someone put the test in front of you. And then there's also the Google Form version that looks more like the homework that a lot of you guys have been doing over the past several weeks. So again, due date is the 26th of May at the end of the day. And then the final exam will go live. It will be available for you guys to look at starting on Monday, the 24th. So that means that you have all day next week on Monday, all day Tuesday, and all day on Wednesday to work on the final exam. Tuesday, when we meet together as a group, we will be doing a review of all of the material that we've talked about so far this term. So I'll kind of be briefly hitting on some of the main, important, main points and important ideas from a whole bunch of subjects that we have covered so far this term, going all the way back to the beginning. Because the final exam covers everything that we have talked about so far in this class. So it doesn't just cover the last couple of weeks of stuff, with evolution and genetics and natural selection and stuff like that. It covers everything all the way back to DNA and mitosis, meiosis, and the turning DNA into mRNA into proteins, all of that good stuff. It'll all be covered on the final. And so that's why on Tuesday, we're gonna be doing a review of all that stuff very briefly and then the last chance to get your final turned in is at the end of the day on Wednesday. Again, it is very, very important that you get your final exam turned in on time because final grades are due from teachers at noon on Thursday. So that means I have from midnight Wednesday till noon on Thursday to get all of the final exams and all of the turned in work from all of my classes graded on Skyward and submitted to the school. So if you turn in the final late sometime Thursday morning or Thursday afternoon, then it's not going to count and you're going to get a zero for the final in your grade book. And that would be very bad. You do not want that to happen. So make sure next week that you start working on the final exam and get it finished up by the end of the day on Wednesday of next week. Also on Wednesday is your last chance to get any missing or late work turned in. So anything that either you still have missing from the class or that you want to resubmit that I told you that you could turn back in for a higher grade. Usually if you scored like really, really low on an assignment, like under 50%, I left a comment saying, hey, you didn't do great on this, but if you want to redo it, you can turn it back in. All of those assignments are also due by the end of the day on Wednesday. 
Unfortunately, I have 60, 70 students this term, so I don't have time to go through and tell every single student if they're missing anything and what they need to turn in. So it's up to you to check your Google Classroom, check your Skyward, make sure that there's not anything that is missing or no comments that I left about resubmitting work. Also, you're free to reach out to me, send me an email or a text and ask, hey, Mr. Stanley, do I have any missing work or is there anything I can resubmit? And I'll be happy to go on an individual basis and check and see if there's anything that you still have to turn in. Again, anything that is not submitted by the end of the day on Wednesday will end up as a zero in the grade book and that could potentially drop your grade down low enough where you don't pass the class. Easiest way to make sure that that doesn't happen is just to make sure that everything is turned in. So that is what the main thing that is coming up next week. The daily assignments for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week are super short and easy. It's just kind of questions about what did you like about this class? What did you think was hard about this class? Um, was there anything that any advice that you would give or anything that you would say kind of going forward about your time at the Excel Center. So some simple questions that should take you no time at all to answer so that you can earn your daily attendance, but still spend most of that time working on the final. So again, last day of class is Wednesday the 26th. On Tuesday the 25th, the last day that we meet together, we'll be doing a review of the whole class, but all of your assignments and the final exam have to, have to, have to be turned in by Wednesday, the 26th. All right, other thing that I wanted to mention for tonight is that I left a comment about it in the stream earlier. But tonight is our shine night at the Excel Center. So we're gonna be celebrating you guys as students and celebrating those students that have really done well and really inspired their peers and inspired us as teachers throughout the past year and the past term or so. That will be going on both in person and virtually from 6.30, so shortly after we finish class here until 8 p.m. tonight. So if you want to drive up to the Excel Center and come visit in person, we're going to have cake and snacks and food and drinks. Or if you'd rather stay virtual and come see what everybody's doing from your computer, I'll be posting the link to the Zoom call that we're going to be using on the Google Classroom shortly. Please do tune in if you get a chance. We're really excited to have a reason to celebrate all the hard work that you guys have done so far tonight. Uh, you'll see all your teachers dressed up in all sorts of fancy outfits. The idea was for shine night to everybody get something that's kind of sparkly or shiny. And so that includes me as well. So you get to see me in a fa fancy shiny blue vest if you turn into that. So that's tonight, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. I'll post the link in the Google Classroom when it's about to get started. So feel free to join either in person or online. All righty, so with some of those announcements out of the way, let's get to our final set of notes for today about camouflage and mimicry. So camouflage and mimicry are two adaptations or two strategies that organisms, mostly animals, use in the wild in order to avoid being eaten and possibly tell others, no, hey, don't mess with me. So we talked about camouflage a little bit actually the other evening when we were talking about the peppered moths and how the white ones camouflage really well on the white and gray tree bark, and the black ones camouflage really well on the dark, soot-stained, dirty tree bark. So camouflage and mimicry are both examples of adaptations. 
So the fact that this turtle right here developed this super pebbly skin so that it could sink down into the dirt and blend in with the sand, or that this rabbit here has a white coat that helps it blend in with the snow and its Northern Territory habitat, is camouflage, a type of animal adaptation that helps animals survive in their environment. So remember when we were talking about genotypes and phenotypes, phenotypes are the traits that you can see on an animal. They are the things you can observe. And then genotypes are the genes behind it. So these guys, their skin color and skin texture and fur color is a phenotype that helps them survive in their environment. So it's one example of an adaptation they have to hopefully do really well in natural selection and pass lots of their genes on to the next generation, right? The whole goal is to survive, find a mate, and make lots and lots of babies. So blending into your environment is a good way to ensure the survival part of that strategy. If predators can't see you, then they're probably not going to be able to eat you either. So camouflage is a really cool way that some organisms have taken in order to avoid predators. Like this is actually an insect right here that is shaped very similarly to a leaf. So if you were a bird that was flying by this tree and just glancing at the leaves for bugs or berries to eat, you're probably not gonna see this guy. All of his limbs are kind of shaped like leaves too. So blending in to your environment, looking like the stuff around you could be the difference between life and death if you are a prey species. So camouflage is all about hiding. It's all about blending in and not being noticed in your environment. So normally if we were here in person, we would play a little game of find the animals where I'm gonna show you a picture of a camouflage animal and I want you to try and tell me where it is. Um, obviously, since you can't point it out on the computer screen that I can see, we're just gonna kind of go through and see how well these animals camouflage in their environment. So if I told you there is a picture of a bird or that there is a bird in this picture down here, you'd probably be like, uh, Mr. Stanley, no, there's like a fence and some trees and a whole bunch of leaves on the ground. To which I would say, uh-uh, there is a quail, which is a type of like small bird that lives on the ground mostly right here. So this quail has very brown and beige kind of speckled feathers to help it blend in to the leaves that it surrounds itself in on a daily basis. Same thing with even large animals like deer may not seem like it, but they are also somewhat camouflaged in their environment. So this one is a little bit easier to see, but if I told you there's a deer and this picture over here, if you look really closely over kind of in the left-ish side of the picture, you might be able to spot our deer hiding behind some trees and shrubbery and sort of blending in with the grayness and the brownness of the plants around it. Again, I'm gonna tell you there is a frog in this picture down here, and you can see lots of water, lots of little green leaves floating around. But up in the corner here, we have our frog. So if you are a predator species that was just taking a quick look as you pass by, or if your eyesight isn't quite as good as a human's, like if you blur your eyes a little bit, the, the frog, the green and brown kind of modeling, and the bumps for his eyes blend in really well with all of the leaves around him. So some more really cool examples of camouflage 
we have this frog over here blending in to kind of this muddy, rocky soil that he's in. We have this lizard camouflaged against the pebbly gravel that he makes his home in. This is a really cool example. This is a walking stick, a type of insect. So it's related to like bees and flies and mosquitoes and stuff like that. But it does not have wings. Its whole body is just one long, thin stick, essentially. It looks just like a stick until you look closer and you see some legs that seem like they're poking off of it. And then if you wait a little while and it feels like the coast is clear, it'll start slowly moving and climbing up the branch. But by looking like a stick, most predators are going to think, well, I don't want to eat a stick. I'm looking for bugs or I'm looking for berries. So he's able to camouflage against his environment and avoid getting eaten. We got some katydids right here. So katydids are a type of insect that are related to like grasshoppers and crickets and stuff like that. They have these super cool, very green, very leaf shaped bodies. So that when they are hanging out on a tree or a plant or a bush, munching on some tasty leaves, they look kind of similar to the leaves that they're eating. So if a predator comes along that wants to eat a bug and said it just sees a whole bunch of leaves, it's gonna think, oh, well, no bug there. Might as well move along. This is a super cool animal called a leafy sea dragon. It's a type of seahorse, and I'm sure that you can see why it is called the leafy sea dragon. So this guy hangs out in kelp forests in the ocean and has all of these productions coming off of its body that look a whole lot like leaves or other types of plants. So when he's just kind of sitting still in the water, bobbing around with all of the plants that are waving around him, he looks just like those plants that predators are not that interested in eating. So camouflage, a very useful adaptation that helps you survive in the wild because if predators can't find you, they can't eat you. And as long as no predators eat you, you've got a good chance of surviving, finding a mate, and having lots of babies. The goal of natural selection and evolution. Here we have either a flounder or a halibut that is nicely, it's modeled coloring, helps it blend in nicely with all these little bit different beige and black and brown rocks around it. So camouflage is all about blending in and hiding. As you've seen from a lot of these examples, a lot of organisms make use of like browns and greens and beige and gray kind of colors in order to blend in with rocks and leaves and sticks and other environmental type things. So they want to look like the plants that they're in or they want to look like the sand or the rocks that they swim along in so that they don't get found by predators. Anybody have any questions about camouflage so far? I was gonna ask if you knew how those lizards would change colors to different colors, you know, mm -hmm. to like, a, uh, like a chameleon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So certain organisms like chameleons um, and other ones that do it are um, octopus actually are also very good at changing their colors and blending in. And so they can't do it quite, chameleons especially can't do it quite as well as you may have seen on like TV where a chameleon like or like a cartoon where they go on like a purple or a blue and then they light up bright blue but they can produce a whole bunch of different pigments in their skin. So they have special cells and special organelles in their skin that can produce different pigments. 
And so when they're in a certain organism and their eyes are picking up a lot of one type of color, that'll send a signal to their nervous system to start producing that type of color in those skin cells, essentially, in those skin pigment cells. So they're actually able to, unlike you and I, which we can only change our skin color if we like stay inside for a really long time and we get a little bit lighter, or if we are out in the sun all day, every day for a couple of weeks and we get a little bit darker, that's about as much as we can do. But chameleons can change the colors to a certain point of their skin by releasing different types of pigment in there. So yeah, chameleons, uh, octopus, uh, cuttlefish, which are kind of similar to like octopus and squids, also extremely clever, have extremely advanced systems of camouflage. All right, great question. Any other camouflage related questions? Oh, no worry, Brandy. Thanks for making it back. Is it a, a walk and stick of camouflage? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, like that's what that picture that we were looking at a little bit ago. Oh, where are we at? Yeah, exactly. Is there are, so walking sticks are a really cool animal and they are native to North America and to Texas even. So you can, if you go and look really hard around certain trees in Austin, you can find some walking sticks. And yeah, these guys are excellent at camouflage. So not only is their color good at making them blend in, but also their body shape looks extremely similar to an actual stick, hence their name. So yeah, these guys are excellent at camouflaging in with their environment. They look just like a stick, and most things that want to eat insects are not interested in eating sticks. Cause I had mistaken of picking one up and I got scared. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when they're not moving, when they're standing still, even to a human eye, it can be hard to tell that they're insects. You really have to look for those legs. And then, yeah, once they start moving, you can see the legs kind of slowly start going. And then it's like, wait a minute, sticks don't move. What's going on here? So, yeah, I'm sure you are not the only one that has ever done that, Naya. Plenty of people have been scared by walking sticks, I am sure. All right, so camouflaging is one type of adaptation. It helps them blend in and hide in their environment. But other animals go the exact opposite route. They get really showy, bright, flashy colors. Like think about the bird, the cardinal, that has a really bright red feathers, or like peacocks that have that huge, beautiful tail. They go the complete opposite direction. They're purposefully trying to show off their colors to the environment and to the other things in them. So they're not trying to hide from predators. They're trying to be out here loud and proud, large and in charge. So there are two different reasons why animals might want to be super bright and colorful instead of hiding. The first one is called warning coloration. So this would be things like certain butterflies, like the monarch butterfly, that's that bright orange color, the poison arrow frogs, uh, Gila monsters. These are all animals that are can sting or smell. Wasps and bees are very bright yellow and black, right? So animals that taste, sting, smell, or are poisonous, so if you try to eat it, it's going to make you sick, those bright colors help to tell potential predators that they are dangerous, right? If you're dangerous, but nobody knows it, a predator might come along and chomp on you to try and get a meal. And sure, the predator might get sick and might even die, but you're dead too. So it didn't really help you being dangerous. But by having these bright warning colors, you're showing the predators, hey, don't eat me. I'm scary. I'm mean. I can hurt you. Leave me alone. So by having those warning colors, it's war it's literally 
like the reason we have stop signs and why those road construction signs are in bright orange to tell you like, hey, watch out, something's going on here, pay attention. Same idea in the animal kingdom. It's saying, hey, stop, slow down, don't eat me. I'm scary, I'm dangerous, I'm gonna make your tummy hurt. You can also have bright colors, like in the case of a lot of birds, you may notice, if you see a male and a female of the species, the female is kind of like a brownish, grayish color, but the male is like really bright red or blue and has these really beautiful pigments in his feathers. That's because some animals use mating coloration. So like a peacock, for example, the peacock is the male and the peahen is the female. If you've ever seen a peahen, they're about the same size and shape as a peacock, but they're totally brown and don't have a big tail. Only the males have that super like gem-like blue and green through them and a giant tail with all the feathers because they are not using warning coloration. So if, an, if a predator caught one and ate it, it's gonna have a nice meal. But instead, they're trying to attract the ladies. So having some sort of bright coloration among males and some animals gives them an advantage in attracting mates. There are a whole bunch of different theories and a whole bunch of different scientific explanations for why this happens. But the idea is it's easier for the females to see them. And if they're bright and showy, it could mean that they're extra healthy, like they don't have any parasites or any diseases that are causing them to lose color. And if they're bright and showy and they can still survive, even though all the predators can see them, then it shows the females like, hey, I'm tough, I'm a survivor. I can take whatever life throws at me. So you either wanna be super bright colors in order to warn and scare predators away or to attract the opposite sex, to show the females like, hey, you should choose to mate with me and have babies with me. I'm gonna make great babies because I am great at being big and beautiful and colorful. So here is a sometimes called a strawberry poison dart frog, sometimes called a blue jeans poison dart frog because of these blue legs back here. But the super bright orange, red, and blue. So classic example of warning coloration. Poison dart frogs are extremely poisonous. Even if you as an adult human ate one, you could potentially die. From it. Even just licking one or biting one could kill you. So these guys really want to show to predators, hey, I'm scary, I'm dangerous, don't eat me. Here are some good examples of some mating coloration. Like I talked about earlier, peacocks have those huge, beautiful tails with all those eye spots that are those bright green and blue and orange kind of colors that it fans out to show to the ladies. And this is a, I believe it's called a frigate bird. And the females look like this, but without this big red thing right here. Only the males have this big pouch. And so when male frigate birds find a good nesting spot, they'll sit there and puff out their pouch and like lift up their head and show their pouch around to the sky. So that as the females come in and are looking for places to land, they're looking and judging males based on how big and how bright and how red that his throat pouch is. So sometimes you want to draw the attention of predators and tell predators, hey, don't eat me. And sometimes you want to draw the attention of your own species and say, hey, look at me. I'm super healthy. I'm super fit. I can make some amazing babies with you. So again, we have some coloration differences in our ducks here. We have our female duck down here, very brown, very gray, very white, kind of blends into the water. And our male duck up here, lots more white, lots this beautiful bright green and yellow bill right here, all so that he can stand out and let the females notice him and pay attention to him. Whereas this lady is just like, I just want to blend in with the environment and I'll be in charge of picking who I think the best looking male is.
So with those warning colors especially, there are a lot of cases in nature where similar but not the same animals look very much like each other. So to the point where it's hard to tell them apart if you didn't know they were different species. And we call that mimicry, which is when one animal of one species tries to look like other animals. So it tries to mimic other similar animals. So for example, right here, we have two different snakes. One of these is a dangerous poisonous snake and the other one is relatively harmless. It'll bite you. If it bites you, it'll hurt because it bit you with teeth, but it doesn't have any sort of venom or poison. And yet they are very good mimics of each other, right? One animal has clearly tried to copy the other one. So does anybody remember there's a famous, so they, so one of these snake, oh, hello, which one I think. This snake is called a coral snake and this snake is called a milk snake. So to, there's a famous, like, um, not net really nursery rhyme, but a famous rhyme that people use to help tell which one is the scary one and which one is the safe one. Does anybody remember how that rhyme goes or what it says or the which way you can tell which one's dangerous and which one's not? The rattle? I'm not exactly sure. So neither of these guys are rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes are a different group of snakes that have those rattles on them. Uh, would it be the bottom one that's poisonous? Maybe. Is there any way that you could tell, or are you just guessing? No, it's because it just looks more vibrant than the top one. Like, <laughs> or maybe maybe that's just the way they, they took the pictures, but yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely possible that this one is more colorful and vibrant. It could also just be the pictures. But the way to check, if you ever cross, come across these in nature, and we do have them in Texas, I saw one about a year ago or so, is that you look at the colors and the rhyme red touch yellow kill a fellow i was kind of thinking it was the pattern mm -hmm. yeah so it goes red touch so they look very similar but they're not exactly the same so if you have red touch yellow kill a fellow that means that the snake that has the red and yellow lines that are touching are dangerous and venomous but red touch black friend of Jack. So on this snake, the red and black lines are touching. So that means that it is not dangerous and venomous. So this guy, a relatively harmless snake. Again, if it bites you, it'll hurt because it's a thing that bit you, but it's not gonna put any venom or poison or anything like that into you. This guy, very dangerous. He is a poisonous, venomous snake. So it might not kill you if it bites you, but it's gonna cause a ton of damage to your body. But they look just like one another, All right? So this guy has mimicked the scarier and more dangerous snake. Even though he's not dangerous himself, he looks dangerous and he looks scary. He has all this warning coloration that tells potential predators, hey, look at me, I'm a big, scary snake. Don't mess with me. But in reality, he's not that much more dangerous than like a garter snake or a corn snake, something like that. So that's one area where mimicry comes in helpful. If you're not dangerous, you can fool predators by looking like something that is dangerous and is scary. So a predator that maybe has learned not to mess with these guys or just has learned that if you see these colors, you should be scared, sees this one and goes, oh, no, nope. I know, I know what to do here. We're just gonna leave that snake alone. I'm not gonna mess with that one. 
So it doesn't have to do any of the work of making that poison, making that venom, but it gets the benefits of not having to deal with predators. Is that is that a yellow red touching thing like for all snakes? Like if the yellow touches the red or if it has those colors? It's, I don't know about for all snakes. I think these are the only two types of snake that have this exact type of color. There are some other snakes that can have kind of like a yellowy brown color um, or who might have like some red on like their belly or something. But these are the only two types of snake that have these really vibrant red, black, and yellow rings. And so specifically for these types of snake, if the red touches the yellow, it's the dangerous one. If the red touches the black, it's friend of Jack. It's relatively safe. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Good question. So here we have another example of mimicry from things that are not even in the same group of species. We have an owl, a classic predator with these big yellow eyes. And we have what's called an owl butterfly, which has these big eye spots on its rear wing. And so scientists believe that it has these eye spots because if a bird is like coming in to maybe get a little butterfly snack as like the butterfly is sitting on a flower and it's got its wings all closed and the bird comes in and is like, oh, I'm gonna try to eat that butterfly and have a nice little snack. The butterfly can opens its wings and all of a sudden the bird feels like there's these scary eyes that are staring out from it. And it might only get confused for a second or two, but it's enough time for the butterfly to make its escape. So it mimics these bigger, scarier animal eyes so that its predators get confused for a little bit or get a little bit startled and they're like, whoa, what the heck is that? And that's all the time that the butterfly needs in order to escape. So another classic type of mimicry involves the monarch butterfly, one of the most famous butterflies that's out there it has this beautiful bright orange and black outline wings. And it's well known to predators like birds because it is very toxic. It has, this is a warning coloration. It's telling birds, hey, don't eat me. I'm gonna taste bad. You're gonna have a nasty flavor in your mouth and your stomach's gonna hurt. So you better not even bother. Go find some other butterfly to eat. This down here, is not a monarch butterfly. This is what's called a viceroy butterfly. It looks almost identical. It's got the same types of little yellow or little white dots around the wings. It's got the same very orange pattern going across most of the wing. It's got the very dark black lines running through it. But it is a different species. It is not the same butterfly as this one. Viceroy butterflies also famously are non-toxic. If a bird was to eat it, it would taste the same and be a tasty snack, just like most other butterflies out there. So this butterfly, this viceroy, has mimicked the monarch butterfly. It looks like the monarch butterfly, but in fact, it is not scary. It is not dangerous. Another type of mimicry we have here on the left is a standard honeybee. Most people know to give bees some space, leave them alone, let them do their thing because they've got that little stinger in their butt. This is a fly. It is no more dangerous than your standard house fly or fruit fly, but it kind of looks like a bee. It has very similar black and yellow coloration and striping. So it can confuse some predators into thinking it's a bee, which will make them leave it alone, right? You do not want a mouth full of bee at any time in your life. That actually happened to my dad once. He was working outside and he had like a Coke or a Pepsi can or something. And he would go back to it every once in a while. 
And once he went back and took a swig and felt something moving around in his mouth. Luckily, he spit it out fast enough so he didn't get stung. But there was a bee that had been checking out this nice sugary substance that my dad had left out for it so kindly that my dad picked up and without looking, put it straight into his mouth. So nobody wants to do that, especially not predators. They don't want to deal with the bee sting in their mouth. So some of them might be scared away from eating this fly that does not have a stinger. It's not dangerous in any way, but it kind of looks like a bee. Same thing with this guy right here. This guy looks very much like a wasp. It's got that black and yellow body. It's got kind of these strong segments right here. But this is not a wasp. This is a moth. The little nighttime butterflies that you see flapping around by a light at nighttime. One of the ways that you can tell it's a moth is because it has these big fluffy antennae on the front. And wasps do not have big fluffy antennae. They have very thin stick-like antennae. But again, looks like a scary wasp. And a lot of predators in nature have learned that wasps are not something that you should be messing with. And so maybe this guy's hoping that by looking like a wasp, he'll be able to be left alone. So that is one type, or probably the most famous type of mimicry. There are lots of animals that practice mimicry that are all about trying to get information to predators that, hey, I'm scary, I'm dangerous, when sometimes you actually might not be. You might be just a simple little wasp or a simple bee or a very tasty, non-toxic butterfly. But by copying the scary one, by copying how it looks, how its body is shaped. They don't camouflage to escape predators, so they don't blend into their environment because usually there's some sort of warning coloration that goes on. But they can look scary without actually being scary. All right, anybody have any questions on camouflage or mimicry, how they work or why they work as good adaptations to the environment? Okay, any other general camouflage or mimicry questions kind of in general, stuff about why animals look the way they do that you wondered about but never quite understood why? Right. Cool, cool, cool. Well, pretty short and simple class for tonight. Again, I wanted to make this one kind of fun, kind of lit more laid back so that we have a chance to kind of sit back and take our breath before we jump into the final and getting all caught up on material by the end of the term. So for the homework today, I posed you two questions about mimicry that I want you to answer. The first should be pretty easy because it's very similar to what we talked about tonight, but the second one you might have to think about a little bit. So your mimicry questions for your daily assignment for today. The first one talks about Batesian mimicry which is essentially the fancy scientific name given to what we were just talking about. When a harmless species mimics a more dangerous or poisonous species. So I want you to write me not too much, like maybe 
two to three sentences or so about why is it an adaptation for you to look scary even though you aren't. For if you're a harmless, if you're a normal tasty snack for more, most predators, why would it be useful to look dangerous? So that one is pretty similar to a lot of the mimicry stories and mimicry examples that we had for tonight. The next one might make you think a little bit more. There's a second type of mimicry called malarian mimicry. And it's when two different species that are both dangerous, they're both foul tasting or poisonous to predators. So they both are not good snacks. They both have some sort of poison in them. They look like each other. So even though they're not the same species, they look like the same species and they are both scary, both poisonous. So I want you to try and think about why would it be an adaptation for a different poisonous species to look the same? If I am a scary, toxic, poisonous species, why is it beneficial for me if I look like my cousins that are also scary, dangerous, poisonous species? So that is the second question about mimicry that I want you to think about and come up with your own answer to. All right, does anybody have any final questions, comments, concerns about animal adaptations and coloring, camouflage, mimicry, or the daily assignment in question for today? All righty. Well, if not, then I think that is a good place for us to wrap it up.